Well, good afternoon, and thanks again for all of you joining us this, this afternoon. Today, I'd like to review our numbers, talk about testing, and discuss some programs to help people as we move into phase three uh, and managing COVID over the long term. First, as we approach the end of June, I want to remind Virginians of how far we have come. When the pandemic began, watching other states, we worried that our hospitals would be overwhelmed with COVID patients. We considered building new temporary hospitals. We didn't know if we had enough ICU beds or ventilators. We knew we needed more PPE and that we needed more testing and testing supplies. America saw little to no leadership from Washington and states and governors like myself came to the realization that we would be on our own. We said stay at home. We closed our schools for the rest of the school year. We issued restrictions on businesses and gatherings. We moved restaurants to take out and we urged our houses of worship to give sermons online. Many businesses, including state government, moved to telework. We have gotten familiar with social distancing and Zoom meetings. I've had three this morning and I'll have some more this afternoon. In the three and a half months since our first case, we've learned a lot about the virus, how it spreads, how contagious it is, and how we can keep ourselves safe. Our efforts to slow the spread continue to work. Other states are seeing surges now as people move about more. But in Virginia, so far, we are not seeing a surge in cases. In fact, our numbers are very good. Today's percent positivity number is the lowest it's been in weeks. This is entirely thanks to all of you. You have helped by staying home, washing your hands, and wearing face coverings. We all need to keep doing all of these things because we do not want our numbers to go up like we are seeing in other states. Especially as we ease restrictions next Wednesday in phase three, it is vital that everyone continue to be cautious. This virus has not changed. It has not gone anywhere. We can see that in the numbers from other states. The only thing we can do is protect ourselves and behave responsibly. So let's take a look at some of our numbers. First, our percent positivity continues to trend down. And the latest number is 6%. That's the yellow line on this slide. And our hospitalizations for COVID have been trending downward as well. The yellow line is the moving average. The light blue is COVID patients on ventilators, that's at the bottom, and the medium blue is those in the ICU. The dark blue is the total COVID patients that are hospitalized, and, and all of those continue to trend downwardly. And while you can see that while more hospital beds are occupied, we're still not close to our surge capacity. All along, we've said that increased testing and tracing are critical to keeping this virus in check. We have been able to ramp up our testing in the past several weeks. I wanna take this opportunity to have Karen Remley, Dr. Remley come forward and, and kind of go over where we've been with our testing and, and how we plan to move forward. But I also especially want to take this opportunity to thank her. As you know, she used to be our commissioner of health. Um, and as I will announce a little bit later, uh, she has taken a job with the CDC, um, so we will have that inside connection, but we uh, certainly thank you, Karen, for all that you've done, and, and we wish you best uh, on your next uh, adventure. So welcome. Thank you, Governor. Um, so I'll begin with uh, the slide that you all have seen before, but I can't show it enough times because I remind myself of this every morning, hand washing, six feet away, wearing your mask, and making sure you understand if you have symptoms are the things we've all done as Virginians that have made a difference. So we'll go to the next slide, which is that classic epi curve. 
And uh, remember, this is not when the, the test is done to say somebody has COVID, but is when somebody actually has symptoms. So it goes back farther. And as you can see, we have that curve going up, we flatten that curve, and now we're seeing that curve come down. And one of the things that's really important, the sooner we can make that diagnosis, the sooner we can isolate someone, and the sooner we can slow down our rate of spread. And that's why it's important to follow this closely and see this. Next slide. This is a complicated slide for all of us to look at. It comes from the UVA as we looked at their models. And what this looks at is the rate of infection. And we're starting off in March, and you can see we've slowly but surely come down. Another word that's called is the r naught. And what that really means is if I'm infected, how many people do I infect? And so you want that number to be less than one because you want to make sure if I'm infected, I haven't infected anyone else. Um, and we right now statewide are at 0.727. As I said, our goal is to be less than one. As you can see, we have a little bit of variability around the state. We continue to work very aggressively at contact tracing, identifying cases early, and making sure people have accessibility to test. Next slide. So as the governor said, um, here's the number of people tested, the number of positive tests and percent positivity. And as you can see, we're consistently, and if we had also the slide that shows you the seven-day average, our seven-day rolling average now is consistently at 10,000 tests per day, which is what our goal was. We have some days where we may be doing 15,000, some days where we may be doing eight. But overall, um, we're seeing that consistent need to be able to test about three to 4% of our population. And so as we look at this, as the governor said, the most important thing is you're also seeing not just increased testing, but also decreased number of cases and a decreasing percent positivity. Next slide. A lot of people have asked about antibody tests. And as you know, um, not only do we get the PCR results reported to the state, we also get antibody tests reported to the state. To date, we've had 53,000 antibody tests that have been reported. Of those, only 6.4% were positive for the antibody. And if you take the confirmed cases that also had an antibody test, there were 2.1% that had a positive antibody test that actually had a positive PCR. Remember that all of the people who have a positive PCR don't necessarily get an antibody test. And of those probable cases, 17% had a positive antibody case. So that was, uh, and then of the not cases, so people who didn't have a positive PCR just had an antibody test, only 3.2% were positive. And of those, remember, some of those will be false positives. Next slide. And so one of the questions that we all ask is, do we have enough lab capacity? Because we know when we started this journey, we didn't have enough lab capacity. So how do we build on that? And building on something that already exists is always easier than starting from scratch. So there's something called the Public Health Laboratory Response Network. It started in 1999 to start to look at bioterrorism. And if we had events of bioterrorism in our country, how would we have a network of labs around the country that would be able to support our needs? At that time, um, here at DCLS, we were part of that network and continue to be. With it, as you can see, it's the federal labs, the state labs, and then Sentinel Hospital and local labs. We've used this for H1N1. We used it during Ebola, and we're going to expand that network to be able to use it now for COVID-19. Next slide. Through the governor's approval using CARES Act, we will have a one lab network. So we will expand the cap capability of DCLS and Fairfax, our two large public health labs in our state, but also um, partner with at least three institutions, um, facilities to be able to expand their ability to do testing specifically for public health. And this will allow them to expand to, we start off with a thousand PCR tests today, but if we need to go more greatly, we can expand that and build on that capacity. Our plan is to make sure that the capacity we build for exceeds what we imagine we will be seeing through the UVA model. Next slide. So as we talk about that, our broad testing goals. Anybody who's symptomatic or who's had a close contact, who's been referred by public health to seek testing, or a clinician deems that they need to be tested. We talked about two to 4% of the population a month per district. We want to make sure that's not just statewide, but every district. So we're looking across the Commonwealth for disease. That's between 6,000 to 13,000 tests per day. Making sure that we're less than 10% positivity for each region and over testing those high risk populations. So we've talked about this before, the socioeconomically disadvantaged, people with chronic illnesses, the elderly, people in congregate settings. 
We're in the process of doing point prevalence surveys in long-term care facilities. We're working with the nursing homes and assisted living, getting those point prevalence surveys done. We've also been testing in prisons and jails and behavioral health. We continue to do, there are over 400 outbreaks in this state that we do outbreak testing and containment. Um, our containment efforts are much more aggressive and fast now because we've got access to that testing so can very quickly identify that. And then overall containment through contact tracing. And then I always say we try and also be very good stewards of all of our funds and make sure when appropriate insurance that we should cover that test for a clinical need and that the HHS portal for the uninsured that we're using those whenever possible. Next slide. So what does that look like going forward? This is based on the UVA models. We um, anticipate in May, and we did um, far exceed the number of tests that we needed to do per month, 30,000 per month. You look at that, then you say, okay, if we've got that many cases, then how many contacts do we think we might have? How many public health coordinated tests did we do? What's our testing goal? So you can see for May, that was 6,500. We were significantly over that. Um, in June through August, that's going to be around 10,000. September to December, around 11,000. This is based on the current UVA model. But as I said, we looked at the one lab concept. We looked at what was the worst possible scenario, which we're not predicting now, to make sure we had that lab capacity if we need it. Next slide. The other thing we're starting now in July um, to make you aware of is this is something that we do at the health department every year in partnership with our outpatient providers. We look for influenza in, um, in facilities, doctor's offices around the state. We pick two doctor's offices or outpatient facilities per district. We do five specimens a week. It's whoever comes in with symptoms that are consistent with COVID. Those first five who agree to be tested, we do those tests. That'll be 350 total tests a week or 1,400 a month. That gives us an idea of what the disease looks like around the state. One more piece of information for us to have. We'll be doing the influenza sentinel screening too. And then the second is we will be looking at vulnerable populations by using a similar method. So imagine that we'll be doing essentially um, these sentinel surveillance in nursing and in correctional facilities, homeless shelters, low-income housing complexes, anywhere where we've identified there might be a higher risk of disease. Next slide. And then something that I am particularly proud as a Virginian to share is that for every individual in our state who has been identified as having a positive COVID test, that we need to do contact tracing and provide clinical care. Because of the incredible strength of our partners, um, we are able to say that in every district, every patient has somewhere to be referred to for a medical home. And uh, our free clinics went from um, four free clinics in April that were testing for COVID. They're now up to 26 and that's more than anywhere else in the country. Our federally qualified health centers are partnering with us to make sure that people who are tested have clinical care. And CVS, through their Minute Clinics, has also expanded significantly so that we are sure we can meet every um, patient's needs and everybody who's been exposed needs. Um, there are also many COVID clinics that our healthcare systems around the state have put in place. Next slide. And so I would just stop and say it's been an honor to do this. I could give me the permission to say that. Um, as a Virginian, there's nothing more fun than helping other Virginians. Um, I think the governor says um, Virginia is the best place to do business, but I also think it's the best place to have partnerships with public health, health care, the business community, um, everybody coming together to do what they can do for um, COVID. And, and it's a success story for now. But I would say as a mom and a grandmother and a public health physician and a pediatrician, nobody let your guard down um, because it's going to be a long, long summer and a long fall for COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, once again, Karen, thank you, one, for the, the overview and, and thanks for all the work that you've done. You, you uh, may not know this out in in uh, Virginia, but uh, Karen and I go back a little ways. We're, we're dear friends. We uh, both were on the staff together at Children's Hospital of King's Daughters. Karen, back in our earlier days, was a, an ER physician. Uh, I was a child neurologist, and I know we'll forget uh, uh, one early morning hour at, at 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. Uh, I received a phone call from Karen, and she said, uh, Ralph, I have an interesting patient to discuss with you. And, and my response was, Karen, at 2 o'clock in the morning, nothing is interesting to me, but I will be glad to, to hear your case. But, um, Karen, thank you for, for everything that you've done.
Now I'd like to talk about our efforts to help people who are finding it difficult to pay their bills. The pandemic has created unprecedented challenges. People who did all the right things, who worked and were able to pay their rent and their bills have found themselves out of work and also out of money. Virginians are facing a number of difficulties, but having a safe and stable place to call home shouldn't be one of them. Housing stability is a nationwide challenge, and Virginia has worked to be a national leader in ending homelessness and investing in affordable housing. We also recognize that we have an eviction crisis in Virginia, and a number of our localities have had some of the highest rates of evictions in our country. Over the last two years, we have worked closely with the General Assembly and localities on programs to reduce the rate of evictions. However, the pandemic has demonstrated that many families, especially minority families, are one financial challenge away from an eviction. Early in the pandemic, my administration worked with the Virginia Supreme Court to stop eviction cases. Then, at my request, they put a moratorium in place. They extended it through June the 28th. Well, that's Sunday. Once the moratorium is lifted, it is expected that thousands of Virginians will face eviction, and that's just not acceptable. So today, I'm calling on our chief circuit court judges around the state to further extend the moratorium as appropriate in their locality. They have the authority to do so. In addition, we are taking action at the state level. I have directed the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development to create the Virginia Rent and Mortgage Relief Program using $50 million in Federal CARES Act funds. The program will help cover rent and mortgage payments on behalf of households who are experiencing financial instability due to the pandemic because we know the pandemic is having a disproportionate health and financial impact on people of color, this program will have an equity lens and target outreach to those communities. I urge all landlords and lenders to partner with the state on this effort so we can help families get current on their rental and mortgage payments. Our priority is to prevent evictions and help get Virginians back on track with their rent and mortgage payments. More information, including how to apply, will be available when the program launches on Monday, June the 29th. We're also working to help folks who are having trouble paying their energy bills. The Department of Social Services operates an existing energy assistance program, which offers cooling assistance for low-income families with children less than six years of age, senior citizens, and Virginians with disabilities. Applications are open through commonhelp.virginia.gov. I'll repeat that, commonhelp.virginia.gov from now until August the 17th. Additionally, DSS is preparing to launch a one-time COVID response energy assistance program in mid-July, again using CARES Act funding. The program will help households that aren't typically eligible for energy assistance. The focus of that program will be to help pay off energy debt that they've accumulated during the pandemic so as to avoid disconnections when the moratorium on service cutoffs ends on August the 31st. VDSS will also issue one-time supplemental payments to households that have previously received fuel or crisis assistance. DSS will release more information on both of these programs next month. As I said on Tuesday, Virginia will move into phase three next Wednesday, July the 1st. July 1 also marks the day that legislation passed by the General Assembly in its regular session takes effect. I want to highlight some of those bills that are especially important to what's going on now. We took steps toward criminal justice reform with bills to decriminalize marijuana and raise the felony threshold, both of which will reduce the chances that a person gets a criminal record 
for a relatively minor offense. We ended permanently the practice of suspending someone's li driver's license for failing to pay court fees to help ensure that we're not punishing poverty. We also wrote new laws to establish transparent policies for how police departments use body cameras. The Commission to Examine Racial Inequity in Virginia Law, which I established last year, found nearly 100 instances of racist or discriminatory language in the Acts of Assembly, and we passed legislation to remove it. Earlier this month, I extended that commission and expanded its mission so that it will recommend changes to current policies or regulations that are inequitable or discriminatory. We we'll also have new laws making it easier to vote. This includes early voting with no reason required, removing the requirement of a photo ID for voting, making election day a state holiday, and extending our polling hours. As we mark the progress made during the regular session, we're also looking toward a special session later this summer. While that will primarily focus on how to adapt our state budget around the lower revenues and additional cost of the pandemic, there is clearly a need to address issues of racial injustice and police reform. I have had conversations with lawmakers about potential legislation and I will continue to meet with them and others as we shape this reform agenda. I am committed to continuing this work and making meaningful change. I will look for policy proposals that protect our communities, increase accountability, transparency, and diversity in law enforcement, and improve the way we handle our response to people in a mental health crisis. These are serious issues and will require a thoughtful, serious process to create real reform that works for our communities. Before we turn to your questions, I want to address a couple of other issues. As our DMV offices have reopened, they're requiring appointments. That means people who must go into a DMV to renew a license or get another service may have trouble getting an appointment before their license or registration expires. We previously gave a 90-day extension to renew licenses, registration, or other credentials that expire before July the 31st. Today, we're giving an additional 90 days to do that. We also expect more appointment slots to open up as more DMVs reopen. I also know that back to school is already on everyone's mind. We're hearing a lot of questions. and and I appreciate that. So I want to uh, ask our Chief of Staff, Clark Mercer, to come up and perhaps clarify a bit and maybe answer some of those questions as we move forward. Clark, welcome. Thank you, Governor. Um, so we have gotten a lot of questions and inquiries and suggestions about our, our kids going back to school this fall, and we have a number of uh, parents in this administration with young children. We understand uh, just how stressful and intense it has been uh, to have our children home with us over the last several months. I can assure you uh, we appreciate the juggling act uh, that uh, parents throughout the Commonwealth uh, have, been, have been doing. And I wanted to clarify, we've gotten some inquiries from our state legislators as well as parents of students around the Commonwealth. And a few weeks ago, we released uh, the state's guidance for Virginia's pre-K through 12 schools uh, to help with their reopening plans. Uh, the Virginia guidance document, it aligns with CDC guidance for reopening and provides considerations for school divisions in the first three phases of reopening. And we are all going into phase three next week throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, it is intended to inform the discussions happening at the local level, but it does not mandate any one particular approach. Guidance is not law. Uh, this is up to your local school boards to decide how they're going to open responsibly. Virginia is a very diverse state. We have the infection rates that we have seen on these graphs. They are different throughout the Commonwealth. We appreciate that. As we reopen and as school boards grapple with their ability to reopen, teaching remotely, they need to take all of these things into consideration. Um, it has been represented that the guidance is, in fact, law to these localities. That is not the case. Um, 
Certainly, we will continue and would like to take suggestions from legislators and from parents throughout the Commonwealth. But if you do not know your local school board member, most of our school boards throughout the Commonwealth are elected. A handful of them are appointed. I would encourage you to get to know your school board members and discuss the reopening plans for your jurisdictions uh, with them. The final decisions about reopening are squarely in the hands of local school boards. Local pub public health conditions, community concerns, and practical facility constraints have to be taken into account in these school reopening decisions. And we believe our local leaders are best positioned to do that thoughtfully. Those communities with no or little transmission should also consider the CDC guidance on those particular circumstances. The state's guidance document recommended three phases of reopening and like Virginia's businesses, we recommend that schools enter phase three next week. And I will say all of this in terms of reopening, whether it's businesses or schools, are predicated on doing so responsibly and making sure that that graph that we see with the infection rate stays steady or declines. As the governor said, we do not want to see Virginia in the position of several other states that are seeing sharp increases. That's the worst thing that can happen. We have had some comments about transmission among our youth and how impactful that is to their health. We also have to keep in mind, one, we have a number of youth throughout the country becoming infected, especially in other states where we see the transmissions increasing. That 18 to 29 year old age set is now the fastest increasing age set for positive cases. We have plenty of teachers and faculty and staff from our janitors to folks that work in the cafeteria to our teachers to our principals and administration who are in that age set where they would be very susceptible to COVID. And as anyone that has children know, once something starts spreading into school, you will get it at home and we expose our family members, our grandparents, our aunt and uncles, and folks throughout the community. We all know how quickly um, viruses spread through school-aged children. So by way of reminder, phase three of our guidance recommends all students be served in person with consideration for mitigation strategies such as physical distancing in place that may trigger altered schedules, altered schedules. And it's important to note phase three is not the end state for our schools. Each phase we've had has been several weeks long and phase three will be as well as the governor and his team evaluate the health data. We know that full-time in-person instruction for all our students is critically important to their academic growth and their personal well-being. And we also recognize its importance for parents getting back to work. As Virginia's numbers continue to trend positively, we have moved through these reopening phases expeditiously. But the phase guidance we issued did not include guidance for beyond phase three. Those discussions are underway with our education and public health experts. And the guidance for beyond phase three will include a path to getting every student in school every day and increasing opportunities for athletics and activities while remaining vigilant about the health of our students and staff. So I hope that clarifies to our localities and our local school boards as they grapple with these decisions. And again, I would just end with where the governor has started and talked at every press conference. This is all predicated on being smart about our own choices, wearing the facial coverings, remaining socially distanced, taking common sense approaches to curb the spread of this disease. And that's how we're going to be able to open up our schools responsibly and get our students back in the classroom. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Norm Oliver to uh, give us a health update. Norm, thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, just very quickly on the uh, numbers. Uh, our cases now stand at uh, 59,946 cases across the Commonwealth. In the last 24-hour uh, reporting period, that is uh, 432 new cases. Total deaths stand at 1,675. Uh, that's 14 new deaths in the last uh, reporting period. Total tests, as you heard from uh, Dr. Rimley, we've done uh, very well. Our total tests now stand at 654,500. Uh, the new PCR tests that were recorded in the last uh, reporting period was 16,391. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, Noah. All right. Be glad to 
answer your questions. Andre, you have any questions today? Sure, Governor. Um, two, if I may. Uh, first, Dr. Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, made a statement recently saying yeah. that there has been a rise of those who don't trust science and the validity of some of the numbers that are coming out as a physician, maybe you and Dr. Rimby. Uh, just wondering how you would respond. And then on sidebar, back in Lynchburg, someone has, a group has filed a lawsuit against your um, signed law on requiring background checks for those who are purchasing weapons, and they see that as unconstitutional. Just wanted to know if you had a response to that pending lawsuit. Yes, sir. Thank you, Andre. The, the first question is about science, and um, you know, I, I would just remind folks uh, we we have scientists that that's this is all that they've studied uh, during their adult careers. Uh, we have epidemiologists uh, that, that you see with us uh, every day, uh, Andre, and and I, I I watch the same things that you watch. Um, I practice medicine for over 30 years, and and obviously there's some people that that don't trust or don't believe the science. But we we are data driven. Um, we as we make decisions, we we make those decisions by by the data uh, that we have. And and I would just uh, continue to encourage everybody to. You know, to to trust us uh, uh, as best you can. Uh, the things that we uh, have have recommended, the guidelines, uh, and I know you've heard them so many times now. But the the, the social and physical distancing, the, the washing of our hands, uh, the the facial facial coverings. We we know how you know this very contagious virus is spread, and so so these are all very much science based and. Anything that we continue to recommend to Virginians will be based on the, the science. The second part of your question was about background checks. Um, uh, Andre, uh, we introduced a, a number of, uh, of pieces of legislation regarding gun safety uh, in Virginia. Uh, these have all been uh, thoroughly vetted with our attorney general, uh, with our, our legal minds. Uh, they are constitutional. Um, and. Uh, I'm confident uh, that they they will stand. Uh, obviously, people can choose to to sue for for whatever reason, but but we are on very solid legal grounds, and and I, I don't expect those to change. Yeah, the question will be from Julie Carey with NBC Four. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I know a lot of people are excited about Phase Three, but I've heard from a number number of Virginians who are worried about moving to phase three, especially because it permits gatherings of up to 250 people. Uh, given the spikes we've seen happen in other states, is there any reconsideration being given to allowing that kind of group size? And, and secondly, um, if not, why do you believe that Virginia won't necessarily go the way of North Carolina in terms of seeing a surge once we open up more? Yeah, Julie, thank you for the question. And and the first part of it is is gatherings of 250, and and obviously those gatherings we continue uh, to uh, encourage uh, social distancing. If if people uh, can't stay six feet apart, then then we wouldn't recommend the gatherings. We also continue to recommend the the facial coverings, which we know uh, work well. So, um, am I worried? I I worry every day, Julie, um, and I watch the data every day and. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to do that. And as I've, I've told Virginians, that if we see the numbers trending uh, in unfavorable uh, directions, then, then we're obviously going to have to make some difficult decisions. So uh, it's really up to all of us as Virginians to, uh, to be smart, to be safe, and, and to, to take care of ourselves, our families, and, and really to take care of others as well. Um, the second part of your question was, uh, what about North Carolina? What about uh, other states? And, and I think the, the same, I would say the same. Uh, we're we're going to watch the numbers in those states, uh, those trends. We also watch the numbers here in Virginia. And, and uh, depending on where, where those numbers go, we'll, we'll make decisions. Governor, two parts as well. Um, why not uh, request a continuation of the moratorium on evictions at the state level rather than going down to the uh, circuit court level? And the other question is regarding the contact tracing. Are we, st or is the state still looking at uh, utilizing smartphone app technology? If so, where does that stand? Yeah, I, uh, I may let uh, Dan uh, 
address the part of it. And this is why I don't like two-part questions. But you, so why, why not uh, request the statewide extension for the moratorium? Yes. The, it's, the yes. Um, a couple of things I would say. Um, the, the extension uh, was because of a discussion I had with our Chief D Justice, uh, Don Lemons. He could not have been more uh, agreeable and, and, and understanding of what's going on. Um, as far as extending that, that, that would be an option, but we, we have a, a plan in place uh, that we, we are confident that we'll, we'll start in time to, to help with this. Uh, in the meantime, as I said, circuit court judges can adjust their dockets um, for uh, the eviction uh, cases. Um, but as far as what, what I can do as, as governor, uh, I can request through the judicial system, but we, we can't that, make that decision uh, at the executive level. So, um, so that, I hope that answers your question. But, but we're going to do everything we can, Cam. The, the point I was trying to make and hopefully made is that we don't want anybody, uh, we don't want, at, want anybody getting evicted at any time, but it, especially during this pandemic, we know people are going through hardships and we want to take care of everybody that we can. So, Dan, you want to address the same? Uh, thank you, Governor. I think the, the question really was two-part, where do we stand with contact tracing? And then a second question about where we are with exposure notification app development here in Virginia. So first, uh, we're really uh, excited about the, uh, the increasing numbers of contact tracing personnel in the Commonwealth. Right now, we sit uh, around 1,050. Uh, about 400 of those are contractors between contracted with the Virginia Department of Health or with the Fairfax and Arlington Health Departments that have, I believe you've mentioned in this forum before, a special MOU relationship uh, with the Virginia Department of Health. So that's increasing, and gradually over time, as additional contractors come on, uh, Virginia Department of Health personnel will, who are doing that contact tracing today will go back to other positions. So that, will, that transition will occur over the, the next several weeks. And again, our initial goal of 12 Hundred is based on that 15 per 100,000. We may find that to do the job adequately, we need a, a higher number, and we'll, we'll learn as we move forward. So that number continues to increase, and uh, we're excited about that workforce. Uh, secondly, the Bluetooth uh, uh, low-emission uh, Apple Google uh, app, we're really excited about the, our partnership with uh, 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 Spring ML uh, along with Google Cloud. And actually this morning, uh, Dr. Uh, Oliver encouraged uh, us to be part of the beta testing of that, uh, app, app, of that app, and uh, I downloaded it this morning. So right now, I am, it's contacting, or excuse me, it's keeping track of who the folks I've been close to uh, as part of our near final testing. So we're excited about that tool. Again, it's a tool to be used by the contract tracing team uh, to be able to find out who, in addition to the interview, hey, let, can you download who you've been exposed to? Because I could have forgotten that I was uh, talking to that someone on the side of the street that uh, when I, if I were to become a, a case or a contact. So we're excited about that progress that we've made, and uh, we'll be ready to uh, make that when we're completed with testing. You know, I, we're, we're moving. Uh, alpha testing was last week. Beta testing is this week. Mid -July. Mid-July, it should be ready for full uh, prime time and dissemination around the Commonwealth. Thank you. Dan. Appreciate it. David McGee with the Bristol Herald Courier. Yes, thank you. I have a question regarding Phase 3. We're hearing from some operators of some auto racing tracks that they cannot financially operate under the restrictions that are even in Phase 3. And just wondering, since those activities occur outside and many of them have large grandstands, if the state might consider exceptions on an individualized basis. The, the question is about the uh, auto racing, and, and I think it's also pertinent for, for other sports, uh, baseball stadiums, et cetera. And uh, as you know, we, we allowed the, the race to, to move forward in Martinsville a couple of weeks ago. That was with no fans. But um, again, as we go into phase three, and uh, Angela, I, I know you're here. If you, if, if I, I don't want to misspeak, but uh, we'll continue uh, to, uh, to have the social distancing. And as far as the numbers, uh, do you want to comment on the numbers at the stadiums and that type of thing? Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Governor. Thank you. No problem. 
Uh, Angela Navarro, Deputy Secretary of Commerce and Trade. So in phase two, these facilities could operate spectatorless um, with individuals there as part of their employment so they could have the racers and the staff who are supporting um, the race itself. Moving into phase three, we can have some spectators. Up to 1,000 individuals um, can participate in these functions. Um, as the governor and the chief have said, these are phases, so they're incremental. Um, and they will adapt over time. But obviously, as we're moving into phase three and removing some of these restrictions, the public health team will continue to monitor the data. Um, but up to 1,000 individuals is what they felt comfortable with, again, with the social distancing, maintaining the um, separation amongst individuals, wearing face coverings, and all of the other requirements that are currently in place for those venues. Thank you. Um, so the first one actually kind of has to do with along, along the same lines. We're hearing from some amusement parks like Kings Dominion right. um, who are basically saying that the 1,000 cap on guests doesn't reflect the large volume of space that they have, um, and they don't really feel like they should be lumped into small entertainment venues like bowling alleys when they do have a vast amount more space. So would you consider making independent requirements for those larger amusement parks. Yeah, Jackie, thanks for the question. It was regarding the amusement parks, and we've had a lot of discussions uh, with the amusement parks, and I, I would just say that, um, you know, I want them to open up uh, as soon as they can, do it safely and responsibly. I mean, a, a lot of the tourism industry uh, depends on them, hotels, restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, but we also, uh, I think, have to, uh, to be cognizant of the fact that there are so many contacts uh, at these amusement parks, people touching different things. And, and so we have had discussions with our Virginia Department of Health, with our epidemiologists, um, and that's the decision that we've made. Um, obviously, we're going to continue to follow the numbers in, in Virginia. Uh, we're in phase three. We'll continue to have those discussions. And as soon as we uh, feel that it's comfortable, uh, that it, it, we feel comfortable that we can move forward safely, then, then we'll do that. And I, I know it's difficult. I, as I've said every time I've been at these press conferences, these, these decisions are, are tough. People have had to make a lot of sacrifices. But I think if, if we look at the reality of what's going on, especially in the other states around us, um, and we've, we're seeing surges in numbers, those individuals are the same folks that come and, and enjoy our, our amusement parks, the, the ability to, to travel around Virginia. So we've got to be very careful as we move forward. We'll continue to, to follow those numbers. And as soon as we, again, as soon as we think it's safe and responsible, then we'll, we'll allow those numbers to increase. Okay, one quick follow-up yes. on this question. Um, you mentioned that you cannot um, extend the moratorium on eviction statewide unilaterally, but you can request it through, through the judicial system. Right. Have you requested that formally at this point at the state level? Not through the Supreme Court. No, I haven't, because we, we've chosen a different avenue. We, we want to do it at the local level uh, with our circuit court judges, and, and we also have a program that we think is going to be very good, and we know that there are going to be a lot of requests. We know a lot of people are vulnerable to being evicted, and so we have that in place uh, ready to roll out. Do you have a sense of how many people could be assisted through that program? I don't know if any. Can I submit? I, yes, I'm going to get you an answer in just a second, Jackie. Welcome back. Yeah. So um, work on housing issues as well. Um, so we will be announcing more details around the program on Monday. As the governor said, um, this is an initial $50 million allocation um, for the program. We are closely tracking all of the unlawful detainer proceedings that were previously docketed um, through the courts. So we're certainly assuming that we will get tens of thousands of applicants through this program, and we will be able to assist a lot of Virginia families that, um, that request assistance under it. Thank you. Taylor Coleman with ABC 13. Hi, Governor. Uh, my question is, if nursing homes can't reopen until 14 days after the rest of the state moves into a new phase, where are uh, nursing homes now in regards to phasing? And does it mean they'll be open on July 14th? And also, are you concerned about the spike of folks getting COVID from Myrtle Beach? And is the VDH working on any guidance for folks who do vacation there and come back to Virginia? You want to address the nursing home? Thanks, Laura. Hi, the, the first question was about the phase reopening of nursing homes. That guidance was published 
uh, late last week. And so the answer to the question of where nursing homes lie in that process will be facility specific. Uh, there's uh, sets of criteria for each phase that we recommend be met before moving into the next phase. So I can't really speak across the board uh, because it's a facility specific answer. So um, um, that's that's the, the answer for that question. The second question was about, I think, travelers to Myrtle Beach and does VDH have guidance on that? VDH does have some guidance around domestic travel. At this point in time, there are no uh, statewide uh, there's no statewide guidance for individuals who have traveled to certain places domestically. You can find that on our website. So there's no restrictions, but obviously lots of these things can change with time. Thanks. Um, yeah, just following up on the eviction moratorium one more time, uh, advocacy groups have been asking you to use your executive authority to extend the moratorium. Is that something you're considering or do you believe you have that authority? That would be a difficult authority, as I've said, at the executive level. And I, you know, we're, we're planning on moving forward with the, the program that, that uh, Deputy Secretary Navarro just discussed and also working with our, our, circle, our circuit court judges at the local levels. And is, is there a reason why you said you didn't request uh, an extension of the, at a statewide level? It, it seems like going on sort of an ad hoc basis where there's different um, rules in different localities basically. No, yeah, no, I appreciate the question there, but I, you know, that, I think the, the Supreme Court, the, our, our Chief Justice was very gracious in, in doing that, and um, I just think we can take a different path moving forward. Um, yeah, Tracy Agnew with the Suffolk News Herald. Tracy. Thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned on Tuesday, Governor, that the numbers at long-term care facilities being reported by PDH are just not the same as the numbers from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Yes. Um, there's a disclaimer on the VDH website that says the difference is due to a number of different factors, reporting requirements, class, case classifications, timelines, and, and others. So can you elaborate on some of those different factors and explain exactly how they're making the numbers inconsistent? Okay. Thanks. The questions about the differences in data from the CMS data on uh, nursing homes and VDH's uh, published data on long-term care facilities that have experienced outbreaks. The main difference between those two data sets is definitions. Uh, the definitions for reporting to NHSN, which is the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is CMS's data system, are different than the reporting requirements that facilities uh, physicians, uh, practitioners have to report diseases to VDH. So those numbers will likely um, not match uh, because of those different definitions. There's also different time frames. VDH's data updates daily. CMS's data, my understanding is that they update that weekly. So that's another discrepancy that would cause that, that difference. Thanks. but can go one at a time. And the first one is also related to long-term care facilities. Um, sorry, Lori. Uh, I, I was wondering how the state's guidance is going to be implemented. Um, like, it's framed as guidance, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, you know, how VDH will determine that nursing homes are following those steps mm -hmm. um, and if they'll be actually required to implement it before they reopen, and that's my first question. Sure, thanks, Kate. So the question's about how are we implementing the Virginia Nursing Home Reopening Guidance, and it is guidance, and it's a set of recommendations, and the components of it that uh, it's essentially um, linked to funding, a lot of it. So for testing, the testing components, for example, if a facility um, wants to seek reimbursement for for that activity, they would have to have done it, obviously. So, but I, what I would say is that largely facilities that we work with, and this isn't unique to COVID, uh, really aim to be compliant with public health recommendations and the tool and the guidance is just to help them think through that a little bit more systematically. And we encourage our local health departments to work with them along the way as well. There's a, um, a point in the guidance where a facility, when they feel like they've met the criteria, is the self um, self-assessed that they uh, notify their local health department through an attestation and then the local health department can be aware of that. It acknowledges that that's correct, right. Mm -hmm. And then 
my other question was actually for the governor specifically, and you know, <laughs> moving towards the special session. Obviously, there's been you know renewed focus on racial injustice yes. injustices in policing, and I'm wondering if you could tell me you know what specific policies related to that you have either proposed or supported leading into August. You know, uh, Kate. Without getting into the details, obviously we need comprehensive reform. Um, I've had discussions with a lot of people in the communities. I've had uh, discussions with uh, the police uh, departments. I just was on the phone before I came to this with the African American Advisory Board. I've also had a lot of discussions with legislators. Uh, as you know, the uh, Legislative Black Caucus uh, just released a, a list of, of their agenda, and, and I, I, I think those are, a lot of those are, are, are great ideas. And so um, we're, what we need to do is, is, is go through that process. Uh, there are a lot of ideas out there, Kate, and, and I'll have those discussions uh, with folks in the community as, as we, we've got some of those scheduled now. Of uh, continued uh, discussions with our our legislators, and and uh, we'll go through that process. We'll probably come back to Richmond around the mid to late part of August, and and obviously that a lot of that is to discuss our budget. But uh, we'll we have a very, fairly ambitious agenda uh, r regarding the other issues that you brought up. So uh, to we'll, we'll we'll work forward with that. Thank you all for being here. If you can just hang with me for a couple more minutes, I I. Uh, I would appreciate that, and I, I, I will be brief. But I, I just wanted to close by saying that when this pandemic began, we held a press briefing to make sure the press and Virginians had as much information as possible. We have kept that up ever since, starting with daily briefings seven days a week and then scaling back to now twice a week. So I want to thank all Virginians who have tuned in to watch these and get information. I particularly want to thank Virginia Public Media for taking a lead role in making these briefings accessible to thousands of Virginians. I'd also like to thank our interpreters, Carrie and Liz, as well as others who have stepped in. And I want to thank you, the press. You have had the difficult job of explaining what can be complicated state policy and health data to the general public. And for many of you these last few weeks, that, that job has also been paired with reporting on the protest around racial injustice. You've done this while dealing with furloughs at newspapers as well. So on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia and, and, and all of us that, that watch this every day, I just wanted to thank you for your work and, and to to remind people that a free press is essential to a functioning democracy and your work is vitally important. Going forward, the regular twice weekly briefings uh, will end. No tears shall be shed. But I, I do want to assure you uh, that we will hold briefings as needed. The Department of Health will continue to update its data daily. And my staff uh, and I will continue to answer your questions, and I expect to hold more informal briefings to update members of the press going forward. So to all Virginians, I appreciate every sacrifice that you have made and continue to make as we adapt our lives to this pandemic. Like all of you, I look forward to the day when we have a vaccine or a treatment. And as you've heard, uh, Dr. Fauci's name was, uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, he is very optimistic, and that's great news that, that we may have a vaccine by the end of this year, and would, wouldn't that be a, a blessing for all of us, and, and that we can all return to as close to a, a near normal as we can. So until then, let's all continue to be careful uh, and take care of one another. And, and I just want to remind you all, uh, and I speak on behalf of what we've been dealing with, this is a very, very stressful time for, for all Virginians, for, for all Americans, for, for that matter, for, for people around the world. And I, I, I feel your, your stress. And I, I just wanted to, to remind all of you to, uh, to, we, to uh, you can agree to disagree, but, but be respectful uh, and be kind to each other. That's the way we're going to get through this. Treat other people as you would have them treat you. So I, I thank you for all of that. And I just thought I would end. You all have asked me a lot of questions, right, over the last few months. And now I'd like to, if I could, ask you all to press some questions. Um, and there will be 
uh, prizes for the winners. Um, and I will uh, let you know in just a second. But, but my first question is a two-part question, and it's for you, Kate, <laughs> if that's all right. Um, I would like you to answer, when was the first case reported in Virginia, on what day, and where in Virginia was that case reported? Mark Kate Fairfax. Is your name Kate? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you you're close. It was it was actually March the fourth. No, you're right. March the you're right. March the seventh. Yes. So, I have a reward for you, and it's one of my commemorative coins. It's it's very very valuable, um, and this is my personal one. But we will make sure that that's delivered to you uh, in the near future. Okay. So so thank you for that. I, my second question. Uh, we've had a, a number of of conferences. Uh, uh, Cam. Uh, maybe I ask you this question. When was the first COVID press conference? On what day? March 15th. Close. You might you want to phone a friend. That's fine <laughs> if you'd like. Okay, start green. 12, March 12th. No, you're getting warmer. <laughs> Eleven? Warmer. Nine. <laughs> warmer. You all are getting warmer. March. Early March. Remember, I mean, the winner, if you give me the date, we'll, we'll get one of these commemorative coins. So, I mean, just. Was it March 6th? March 6th. There you go. All right. Good job. All right. And our last question, and anybody can answer this in the, from the press, but we've had a number of these uh, press conferences, and we appreciate the opportunity. But, so I would like to know, including today's press conference, how many press conferences have we had related to COVID-19? <laughs> <laughs> you're, uh, you're a little bit off, but yes? 40. Close? 47. Who said 47? Damn. All right. All right. So you, you win another, another commemorative coin. So anyway, thank you all. Uh, for being here. And again, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to make sure that all Virginians have accurate and updated information, and uh, we will continue to have these uh, as needed. So uh, uh, stay safe out there, and uh, may God bless all of you. Thank you all so much.